midday at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, where an American astronaut and two Russian cosmonauts are sitting atop the 160-foot tall Soyuz booster, ready to launch about an hour from now at 2.42 a.m. Central Time, 7.42 GMT, 12.42 p.m. over in Baikonur. This is a live view of that Soyuz rocket on the Site-31 launch pad in Baikonur. This is the third crewed launch on the upgraded Soyuz 2.1A booster, which made its first crewed flight with the Soyuz spacecraft to the International Space Station in April of just last year. Today, a team of launch controllers are watching over all systems aboard the rocket, which at this point is fully fueled and ready for launch. We haven't tracked any issues throughout the day, uh, which began with fuel and oxidizer loading some hours ago. They just completed a leak check on the Soyuz spacecraft, and as we speak, the three crew members inside are going through leak checks on their Sokol launch and entry suits. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. From the International Space Station Flight Control Room, this is Mission Control Houston. I'm Dan Hewitt. I'll be taking you throughout the Soyuz launch and its flight to the International Space Station later on this morning. Here inside the room, flight controllers are looking over the systems on board as they prepare for the arrival of three new crew members flying up on the Soyuz MS-18. The Soyuz population is going to be increasing from 7 to 10 for a few days, with the addition of NASA astronaut Mark Van de Heij, Russian cosmonaut Pyotr Dubrov, and Russian cosmonaut and Soyuz commander Oleg Novitsky. These three are about to begin their planned two-orbit flight to the station, with the docking scheduled a little more than three hours, about three hours and 25 minutes after launch at 6.07 a.m. Central Time, 11.07 GMT, 4.07 p.m. in Baikonur, where we have NASA and Roscosmos support teams and official watching the events unfold. Soyuz MS-18 spacecraft is going to be docking with the Rosviet module. It's on the nadir or the Earth-facing side of the Russian segment, just under the Zarya module. You can see in this graphic here, we're going to have four Russian vehicles attached to the station just a few hours from now. That's Soyuz MS-18, the one currently on the pad and bound for the station. And they're going to join the seven current station residents on board, starting off with NASA astronaut Kate Rubens, Russian cosmonaut Sergei Kuchverchkov, and Russian cosmonaut and Soyuz commander Sergei Rizhikov. They've been on board since they arrived in the Soyuz MS-17 last October. And also on board right now are the four SpaceX Dragon Crew-1 astronauts who've been on board the station since November. And that's three NASA astronauts, Shannon Walker, Victor Glover, and the Crew-1 commander, Mike Hopkins. And they were joined by JAXA astronaut Soichi Noguchi. Shannon Walker is going to be taking over as the Expedition 65 station commander. The change of command ceremony coming up on April 15th, a little over a day prior to Rubens, Kuchverkov, and Rizhikov undocking from the station and returning to Earth aboard their Soyuz spacecraft. Here in Houston, team in Mission Control is going to be monitoring today's launch, getting updates on the flight from their Russian counterparts. Flight Director Paul Kanya is going to be leading the teams for launch and through the first uh, hours of the Soyuz flight. And the Capcom right now is Andreas Mogensen, Andy Mogensen from the European Space Agency. During the Soyuz's climb to orbit, tracking and telemetry is downlinked to ground stations along the flight path, and all of it gets routed here to the Russian Mission Control Center in Koryov, just outside of Moscow. We'll be seeing a lot of this room over the next couple of hours. And as we will be with you for the next couple of hours, if you have any questions about today's launch, the docking, the rendezvous, anything about the International Space Station that you want to ask us, hop on Twitter, use the hashtag AskNASA, and I'll do my best to get through as many of those as we can today. Today's launch is marking the second flight into space for NASA astronaut Mark Van de Heij. This is going to be the first for cosmonaut Pyotr Dubrov. Uh, he's on the right there. And then this is going to be the third space flight for the MS-18 commander and Russian cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky. This expedition also going to be celebrating the anniversary of a very important milestone in human spaceflight history. And he was the first.
On April 12, 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first human to make that slow trek to the top end of a rocket bound to hurl him into the heavens and into the distant frontier of space. And it was a trip into the most unknown of unknowns. Wishing you a good flight. Happy, good flight. We're adding on technology still in its nascent stages. Until this point developed in the throes of conflict, Yuri took to the skies, ascending into orbit for 108 minutes of history. And then after hurtling back through the Earth's atmosphere, Yuri ejected from his space harbinger and parachuted down to the Kazakh steppe. At that moment, he was transformed into a hero for the Soviet Union and the forerunner for humankind's ventures into outer space. And though he was taken from us too soon, those that look to slip the bonds of gravity and reach beyond a terrestrial home will forever revere what he accomplished. For once again, Yuri was the first. The Expedition 65 Crew Soyuz launch is going to honor the anniversary of Gagarin's historic flight with the mission patch adorning the fairing of their launch vehicle. The design of the Soyuz MS-18 patch incorporates a banner depicting uh, the years 1961 and 2021 flanking the number 60, symbolizing the 60th anniversary of human spaceflight. But right now on board the Soyuz today is a NASA astronaut. He's making his second long duration flight to the space station. So let's kick things off by learning a little bit more about Mark Vandehei. So arriving at the space station, something I'll never forget is looking over my left shoulder out the window in the Soyuz where it was either a view of the Earth or blackness of space. And then all of a sudden I could see a solar array. Getting chills even thinking about it right now. It was this beautiful gold, massive. I mean, you, you don't ever train and see a solar array at full scale here. And so there it was, and the Russian commander sitting to my right. I had to really pay close attention, and I was supposed to be too. But as soon as I saw those solar arrays, I broke the silence. I said, wow, and he was like, <laughs> so. So uh, yeah, I was, the, I was definitely a rookie. I was excited. The freedom of motion the inside of the space station is huge. And then working was busy. It was definitely very busy. Uh, I got up there when a SpaceX uh, Dragon spacecraft was docked just because there's a lot of science that requires return and things have to be done in a very specific timeline. It was very fast paced immediately. And the space station is very unique because on the space station, orbit is really a continuous free fall. And because of that, you can have some very unstable structures that might not be able to stay together if you're on the ground. They can stay together on the space station. Flames behave differently because combustion on the ground requires drawing in all these rich gases into the flame because the hot combustion gases go up and away. But there's no up and away on the space station. All directions are equal as far as that's concerned. So that behaves differently. There's all kinds of different phenomena that we can experiment with. That's why it's a wonderful laboratory. Many, many different experiments. Some of those experiments experiments actually have to do with us as the uh, test subjects because we're trying to understand how to have people safely travel for longer and longer distances too. That's just a sub part of all the science we're doing on the space station. Some people have talked about at some point in the expedition feeling like it's time to go home but for me there was always another spacewalk or another vehicle capture that was coming up so it always felt like suddenly I was going home and it surprised me. I'm Mark Vandehei and I'm a NASA astronaut. And Mark is just one of the three flying into space today. So now let's dive in and meet our entire crew. 
Born in Virginia, then raised in New Jersey and Minnesota, Mark Vandehei earned a Bachelor of Science in Physics from St. John's University and a Master of Science in Applied Physics from Stanford University. He was commissioned in the U.S. Army through the ROTC program and served as a combat engineer. In 1999, he became an assistant professor of physics at the United States Military Academy in West Point. Vandehei reported to the Johnson Space Center in Houston in July 2006 to serve as a capsule communicator or CAPCOM in mission control. Selected in June 2009 as one of nine members of the 20th NASA astronaut class, Vandehei first launched to the space station aboard Soyuz MS-06 on September 13, 2017. Serving as a flight engineer during Expeditions 53 and 54, he conducted four spacewalks, spending a total of 26 hours and 42 minutes outside the space station. During his mission, the crew marked the beginning of the first long-term increase in crew size on the U.S. segment, enabling NASA to double the time dedicated to research and achieve a record-setting 100 hours of research in one week. So far, Vandehei has logged a total of 168 days in space. And Mark Vandehei is a flight engineer for today's launch. He's seated to the right of the Soyuz commander, Roscosmos cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky. Born in Cherven in the Minsk region of Belarusia, Oleg Novitsky attended military pilot school and became certified as a pilot engineer. He went on to graduate from the Yuri Gagarin Air Force Academy and earned a master's degree in state and municipal administration from the Russian Presidential Academy of National Economy and Public Administration. Before becoming a cosmonaut, he was a qualified paratrooper instructor, a military diver, and a Class II military pilot with a total of 700 hours of flight time. Selected as a cosmonaut candidate in 2007, Novitsky qualified as a test cosmonaut in 2009. His first space flight was as Soyuz TMA-06M commander and a flight engineer during Expeditions 33 and 34. His second flight to space was aboard Soyuz MS-03, where he served again as a Soyuz commander and a flight engineer for Expeditions 50 and 51. While aboard the space station, he supported arrivals of multiple cargo vehicles and performed science experiments with the Russian ISS research program. Novitsky has a combined total of over 339 days in space. Oleg Novitsky is serving as the Soyuz MS-18 commander and will serve aboard the International Space Station as an Expedition 65 flight engineer. And seated to his left is first-time flyer, Roscosmos cosmonaut Pyotr Dubrov. Born in Khabarovsk, Russia, Pyotr Dubrov graduated from the School of Information Technologies and continued his studies at the Khabarovsk State Technical University graduating with a specialty in software for computing machines and automated systems. Dubrov also studied and received his Master of Sports in Parachute Jumping, and his early career included serving as a software engineer at the Khabarovsk Railways, at Dalcom Bank, and at CBOS Development International. Beginning his cosmonaut training in 2012, Dubrov was certified as a test cosmonaut in July 2014, Assigned to his first space flight as a member of the Expedition 64-65 crew, he will serve as a flight engineer aboard Soyuz MS-18 and on the space station. And we're back now with a quick live look inside the capsule. You can see the commander there in the center seat, Oleg Novitsky. And at the top of your screen is Pyotr Dubrov in the left seat today. And just a reminder, a little bit later in the program, we'll be taking your questions. So hop over to at Twitter, use the hashtag AskNASA, and keep sending those in. Continue on, though, uh, something you'll see inside the cabin. Before departing the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia, the commander Oleg Novitsky was able to describe his inspiration for the selection of the crew's zero-G indicator. We have a quick clip of that. For the uh, weightlessness indicator, I do have it with me. This is one of the heroes of our nice cartoon, Kitten Gaff. Yes, it is him. Especially this year, I believe it has been 40 years since this cartoon came out. 
And uh, the uh, story is that the puppy is waiting at home for the kitten that is flying in space. And here's a closer look at Gav or Woof the Kitten, star of the Russian animated series made from 1976 to 1982 about a Siamese kitten. And you will see that floating uh, just in front of uh, the commander's chair, right in front of Oleg, and we'll see that float once they separate from the third stage of the Soyuz rocket and enter into microgravity. But continuing to get views inside the capsule and of the Soyuz rocket on the launch pad there in Baikonur. We're going to continue to check in on Mark Van de Heij, Oleg Novitsky, and Pyotr Dubrov as they get ready to launch to the International Space Station. And right now we are 41 minutes and 30 seconds away. Uh, launch is time to take place at exactly 2.42 and 41 seconds central. That's 7.42 and 41 seconds GMT, or 12.42 and 41 seconds over in Baikonur. And as I said, we're going to be answering some of your questions. So let's go ahead and start taking a couple of those now. And you can keep sending them in using the hashtag AskNASA. Our first one comes from Kate, who wanted to know, how long can the station provide life support uh, to more than seven astronauts at once? Uh, that's a really great question, Kate. Uh, we don't have a specific amount of time. Uh, this is going to be a handover with 10 people on board, so that does put a little bit more of a strain on your resources. But thankfully, we have what we call regenerative life support, so we're able to recycle uh, a lot of the oxygen. We actually generate oxygen uh, from water, which we have more than enough on, on board the space station. And then you have uh, other life support responsible for scrubbing carbon dioxide uh, and also providing drinking water. And we have enough food and other consumables on board uh, to last for several months. And so uh, more than enough on board to, to keep these 10 crew members going for a couple of days. Uh, and also we'll have plenty when we do the Crew 2, Crew 1 handover, where we'll bump all the way up to 11 on board for a couple of days. Uh, our next question comes from Whitney, who said, silly question, but wanted to know how many flight suits do they give you? And do you ever actually use all of those pockets? Happy launch day. Um, it's it's going to differ for the astronauts. They do get a couple, uh, just in case any get damaged or dirty. Um, and I will tell you from personal experience, you do end up using a lot of those pockets, and you also end up forgetting stuff in those pockets, only to find it several months later when you put the flight suit back on. All right, and we'll do one more, at least one more. This one uh, from Chrissy, who wanted to know, what will the sleeping arrangements be on the station with 10 people? And we get this question a lot. Um, so right now we have seven crew quarters, uh, with the kind of the individual sleep stations for crew members on board the space station. We just installed a new one just this week inside of the Columbus module. So with the extra three, they do what's essentially called a camp out. They find uh, space in the different modules where they'll set up a temporary spot where they can attach their sleeping bag to the wall um, and they just kind of camp out there for a couple of days. The crew on board works with flight controllers here on the ground to pick those spots um, to give the astronauts as much privacy as possible when they don't have their own crew quarters, and it is just temporary. Um, our next one comes from Alejandro, wants to know how much gravity the astronauts have during takeoffs. So how many Gs are they pulling? Uh, with the Soyuz, it's a fairly benign ride uphill. Um, they'll pull about three or four Gs at a maximum on the on the way up, um, primarily once they're under the power of uh, that second and third stage. Um, so not too bad. Uh, they typically pull a little bit more on the way home, uh, but the ride up pretty smooth um, with those liquid fuel boosters uh, powering them up the whole way. And we'll go ahead and take one more. This one from Get Well Wickens wants to know, is the Soyuz rocket a one-time use or are there reusable parts? Uh, the rocket itself is a one-time use. It's an expendable. Um, so all of these different rocket parts will either fall to the ground um, in uh, the, the vast expanse of Kazakhstan uh, or in some of the cases like uh, the very upper stage uh, burn up upon reentry in the Earth's atmosphere. 
but keep sending those questions. Uh, so now we're giving you some video here. This is from yesterday, where a Russian Orthodox priest did the traditional blessing of the rocket. And this is done uh, prior to every single flight, a uh, blessing of the rocket, and then it typically will do a blessing of some of the, the pad engineers and some of the other officials, and then moving over to give the media a quick blessing as well. <laughs> Today's activities in Baikonur, though, began several hours ago as the crew was woken up uh, in the Cosmonaut Hotel in Baikonur. There is room here. In a time-honored tradition, as you can see, uh, our commander doing here before departing, the three crew members signed the door of the rooms they occupied at the Cosmonaut Hotel. It's looking good. For Novitsky, this was his third time signing. For Dubrov, his first, as he's the rookie amongst the crew. And then Mark Van Hai about to make his second flight uh, aboard a Soyuz spacecraft and to the International Space Station. This was his second time signing a door inside the Cosmonaut Hotel. They were woken up at about 3.05 a.m. local time uh, over in Baikonur. It was about 5.05 .05 p.m. Uh, central time here in Houston, or, or uh, 22.05 GMT. Uh, okay, follow me now. This way. And then just about three hours after waking up, the crew departed the Cosmonaut Hotel. You can see Six flight suits there, so the prime crew in front, the backup crew behind them, that's NASA astronaut Anne McLean, Russian cosmonaut Anton Shkaplerov, and another Russian cosmonaut Oleg Artemyev. The backup crew stays in quarantine with the prime crew throughout their stay uh, in the cosmonaut hotel and their final uh, time in Russia beforehand. And they're with them as they go through their final suit up and rides out to the pad. Again, another time-honored tradition of flying aboard the Soyuz, the Russian Orthodox priest blessing the crew as they make their way out of the hotel and get ready to board a bus and head over to get their suits on. That's enough, enough water. And so after a quick shower, they wave farewell to those that are gathered at the hotel, pose for a few final photos, and then board the bus. And then they are bound for what's known as Building 254, or the Suit Up and Integration Building. The Cosmonaut Hotel on the very edge of the town of Baikonur, uh, just outside of the Cosmodrome grounds proper. It's about a 40-minute ride from their hotel out to the suit-up building. Again, all of this happening about three hours after they woke up, about 6.05 in the morning, so an early morning for everybody there in Baikonur. Good morning to everyone. This is good. And so once they arrived at the integration and suit up facility, building 254, the crew underwent some final medical exams and then suited up in their Soka launch and entry suits. They're in these throughout all of the dynamic phases of flight, so they're essentially wearing these in their very quick 
about three hour and 25 minute journey up to the space station. So they're wearing them now um, all the way until they arrive. And these Soka launch and entry suits are primarily worn. If you're familiar with uh, a lot of uh, the different space vehicles, you're wearing these suits uh, during the ride and they're there to protect you in the event of uh, what's called a cabin depressurization. So if for whatever reason a spacecraft were to lose uh, the integrity of its hull, if the cabin were to go down to vacuum, these suits are connected to breathing air and can pressurize to protect the crew in the event that something like that happens. And that's why we have them wear these throughout all of what we call the dynamic phases of so things like a launch or any time you're rendezvousing, docking, undocking, and then coming home, the crew members will be wearing these suits. The small blue knob you can see right at the top part of the chest is used to adjust the pressure once they go through uh, the inflation or the pressurization of the suit itself. And after they get suited up, and we'll see it in just a moment, uh, each of the crew members goes and gets a quick uh, pressure check or a leak check on these suits. And so we'll be able to see them uh, inflate a bit. But again, for, for Mark Van Heide, this is the second time he's done this exact same process. Again, so after they get the suits on, they move over to get a pressure check just again to make sure that the suit is free from leaks, they each get into basically a mock-up of a Soyuz seat. So what you're looking at is what it looks like once they're inside the capsule itself. They're assisted by suit techs uh, who then connect their suits to a simulated line uh, to pressurize the suit and start flowing breathing air throughout it. And so you'll see once they get locked in, the suits will kind of puff up and that's how you can know that they're pressurized. It's easier to see uh, if you pay attention around the leg area and you'll see everything looks a little bit puffier. Again, the crew goes through this one at a time. Uh, while all this is happening, and we'll see it in just a few moments, uh, there's a pane of glass uh, to help maintain that strict quarantine. Uh, that's true for all crew members spending long duration flights on board the space station. Uh, it's not something that we've implemented just in the last year in the current pandemic climate. Uh, a quarantine has been standard for crew members bound for the International Space Station for many years uh, as they're uh, essentially launching into a closed environment uh, and one of the uh, negative effects of living in microgravity for a long time can actually suppress your immune system. And so we want to make sure crew members are as healthy as possible, not bringing uh, any cold bugs or anything like that up there with them. So they're kept in a very strict quarantine. Uh, access to the crew is extremely limited in, the, in this time. And it's typically about the uh, two weeks right before they lift off. This is the same for crew members flying on a Soyuz spacecraft. It's the same uh, that we've been putting crew members for that have flown up on the SpaceX Dragon uh, in the last, uh, in the Demo-2 and the Crew-1 flights.
And then once their suits were confirmed to be leak-free, we became very close to you, to the whole crew. And we are always here to support you if you need us. It's the most important thing to remember that. According to the evaluation of readiness for launch, the rocket and the boosters are in good technical condition. Everything is working nominally, and I wish you successful completion of your mission. I know you have done everything that has to be done during your preparation stage, and will continue talking to you via Mission Control Center. Your program will be a little bit more full than for previous crews. You will not be bored. Hopefully, you will find some time to rest. And, of course, continue supporting each other and stay good friends. I want to wish you all the best, um, and I want to, you to know that we're very, very proud of you, the, the whole crew, and, and, and know you'll have a great mission. It's been a pleasure watching you guys get ready for this mission. We're looking forward to seeing you on orbit, and uh, you have uh, people across the globe waiting to support you on anything you need. So thank you very much. And again, so they were able to talk to a number of folks uh, inside after confirming their suits were leak-free, uh, speaking with uh, Sergei Korsakov, a cosmonaut who was assigned to the flight up until the swap for Mark Vandehei, also speaking to uh, Dmitry Rogozin and Sergei Krikalov from Roscosmos, and Ken Bowersox and Joel Montalbano of NASA. After that, though, they were able to board their bus. That happened right at about 8.56 a.m. Friday morning in Baikonur for the ride out to Launch Pad 31. And launch pad 31 a little bit further away than Gagarin start, where uh, for years crews have launched uh, from Baikonur to the International Space Station. It took them about 70 minutes uh, to get over to the pad, crew members being helped uh, again in those Sokol launch and entry suits to make their way to the rocket, head up the elevator for their ride to space. Once at the pad, the crew climbing a small flight of stairs, getting set up, taking a few final photos and waving goodbye uh, to officials from Roscosmos and NASA gathered to see the crew members off before they head into the elevator, the ride up to the top of the Soyuz rocket to board their capsule. This all took place about two hours ago, and since then the crew has been uh, in their seats uh, again, Oleg Novitsky is in the center seat. He's the commander of the Soyuz spacecraft. Uh, Pyotr Dubrov in the left seat. Mark Vandehei in the right. Since they've been on board, they've gone through a number of pre-launch checks, uh, confirming a uh, good leak check on the Soyuz capsule itself, also doing leak checks on their suits, continuing to speak uh, with the pad engineers and the launch teams down in Baikonur 
as they continue to count down towards launch. Back now, though, with a live view of that Soyuz, the MS-18 spacecraft, and the Soyuz rocket on the launch pad in Baikonur. And if you're just now joining us, a reminder, liftoff is scheduled at 2.42 a.m. Central Time. Uh, that's 7.42 uh, GMT or 12.42 p.m. over in Baikonur. And as of right now, we are 22 minutes and 5 seconds away from that launch. And as we continue to count down, let's first explore the Soyuz spacecraft in a little bit more detail. The whole Soyuz spacecraft is 24 and a half feet long with an overall volume of 177 cubic feet and comprised of three modules. The descent module, situated in the middle of the Soyuz vehicle, contains customized seats for the crew members during launch, entry, and landing, and contains all the controls and displays necessary for the flight. It also houses life support systems, batteries for the re-entry and landing, and the parachute and soft landing rocket engines that slow the Soyuz just before touchdown as the spacecraft lands in Kazakhstan. There are eight hydrogen peroxide thrusters located on the module, which are used to control the spacecraft's orientation, or attitude, during the descent until parachute deployment. The descent module also contains a guidance navigation and control system used to maneuver the vehicle during the descent phase of the mission. This descent module is 7.3 feet long with a diameter of 7.1 feet and a habitable volume of 124 cubic feet. It is the only portion of the Soyuz that survives the return to Earth. The orbital module at the top is 9.8 feet long. It connects to the descent module via pressurized hatch. This is where the crew has a small amount of room to move around following launch during the flight to the space station. It has a docking mechanism, hatch, and rendezvous antennas located at the front end. The docking mechanism is used to dock with the space station, and the hatch allows entry into the orbiting complex. The rendezvous antennas are used by the automated docking system, which uses radar, to maneuver toward the station for docking. There is also a forward-looking window in the module that the crew can use to take manual measurements of distance and closing speed with a laser rangefinder in the event of failure of the rendezvous radar system. The propulsion module houses the oxygen storage tanks, the main engine, and the attitude control thrusters, avionics, and communication and control equipment. The propulsion portion of this module handles all orbital maneuvers, including those needed for the rendezvous with the space station and the new orbit burn at the end of the spacecraft's mission. Before they are deployed, the two solar arrays are folded against the body of the propulsion module, which, along with the orbital module, separates from the descent module after the deorbit burn. The solar panels span almost 35 feet. The entire spacecraft serves not only as a crew transport vehicle to and from the space station, but also as an emergency return vehicle in the unlikely event the crew needs to leave the station unexpectedly. And we'll be going through this Soyuz spacecraft in a little bit more detail as we continue to watch it fly up to the International Space Station. For now, though, let's take a couple of moments. If you have any questions about the launch or the flight today or anything about the space station, jump onto Twitter, use the hashtag AskNASA, and we will try and knock out as many of these as we can this morning. So let's do a few more. Uh, this first one up from Tristan. Tristan. Wanted to know what are the main things to look for in order to have a successful launch? It's a great question. Um, so this is essentially a three-stage uh, flight to orbit today. The whole thing uh, over in just under nine minutes. Um, we'll look for a couple of key events. I'll outline those for you real quick. So about one minute, 54 seconds into flight, the launch escape tower will jettison. If you look at this view of the rocket, it's the very narrow part at the very top. Uh, that's in place to uh, detach and pull the capsule away from the rocket in the event there's any issue on the way uphill. That will detach at one minute, 54 seconds. And just four seconds later, the first stage will separate. Now, the first stage on the Soyuz spacecraft are four strap-on boosters on the very bottom. They're firing along with the second stage for about the first two minutes into flight. Uh, shortly after that, about 30 seconds later, the launch shroud, so the uh, white part of the rocket just below the launch escape tower, that will break off, and that will unveil, essentially, the Soyuz spacecraft 
uh, to the vacuum of space. Um, that not that's there to protect it uh, in the denser parts of Earth's atmosphere as the rocket climbs uphill. The second stage will shut down four minutes thirty seven seconds into flight, and then it'll separate uh, at four minutes and forty eight seconds. Uh, after that, uh, uh, the lower skirt of the third stage will jettison, and that will continue to fire until just before nine minutes into flight. And so we're really looking for all of those different staging events to take place. And then we're going to look for uh, what's called a, a good orbital insertion. Uh, that'll be the primary thing we want to hear at the very end of the ascent. All right. Our next question comes uh, from Brian, who wanted to know, will the launch be occurring at the time the space station passes over the launch site like it does from the Cape? Um, it's a little bit different for this one, um, as it's timed extremely specifically in order for the Soyuz to make this, uh, this kind of fast track uh, to orbit rendezvous. Um, at the time of the launch, the station will be about 259 miles over northern Uzbekistan. It'll be about 335 miles behind the Soyuz as it leaves the launch pad. Um, but then during that ascent, Space Station will actually leapfrog in front of the Soyuz during the climb to orbit. So uh, when the Soyuz launches, Station will be a little bit behind it. But by the time Soyuz hits orbit, Station will be a little bit in front of it. That's a great question, but it is timed extremely specifically so they can make this quick uh, to orbit about three hour, 25 minute rendezvous. Um, our next question comes from Blockbuster, wants to know, what is the docking in English time? I'm assuming you mean UTC or Greenwich Mean Time. That is a great question. And that's a pretty easy answer because that's the same time that we use on board the International Space Station. Uh, docking today is scheduled to take place at 11.07 and 51 seconds GMT. It's the same uh, time zone that they use on board the space station and that we follow at all of the different flight control rooms around the world just to stay in sync. Our next question comes from Nick, who wanted to know which three Russian vehicles are already docked to the station and what is the station's maximum crew capacity during crew rotation? Well, there are three other Russian spacecraft currently docked to the station. Two of them are Progress or uh, cargo spacecraft, uh, and one is another uh, crewed vehicle. Uh, we have the Progress 75 and 77. Uh, docked to uh, the Earth-facing port on Zvezda and also uh, the very aft, the very back part of station. And the Soyuz MS-17, which carried uh, Kate Rubens and her Russian cosmonaut colleagues uh, up to the space station about six months ago, is already docked. And then pretty soon um, at the Rosviet module or the mini research module number one, in about two and a half hours, or three, about three and a half hours after launch, we'll have the Soyuz MS-18 spacecraft. Uh, the most we've had before um, when we were doing these handovers uh, was about nine, and we're going to have ten uh, when we have two Soyuz spacecraft and uh, the Crew-1 Dragon attached. Uh, we'll go up to 11, and that's expected to be about the max that we'll see for these crew handover periods in the future. That'll happen any time we do what's called a direct handover. Uh, when a new crew launches and arrives at the International Space Station before another crew leaves. All right, our next question comes from Chris Davies, wants to know, is there any plans to have a Russian join a Crew Dragon flight at this stage to return the favor for the many years of Americans on Soyuz? Great question, Chris, and there absolutely is. Um, it's fully our intention to fly uh, what we call mixed crews, so having uh, at least an American and a Russian on every spacecraft going to the International Space Station. Uh, the Russian cosmonauts receive much more extensive training and have a lot more expertise on the Russian segment, which is functionally one half of the International Space Station. And the same is true for uh, American astronauts and the U.S. segment. So to just put us in the best possible posture to continue operating the space station safely, um, and just have really the best people always on hand for the job. Uh, we fully intend to see our Russian counterparts join us pretty soon um, on the U.S. commercial crew vehicles uh, that are currently flying to the space station, like the Crew-1 currently docked. 
All right, let's do one more for right now. This one comes from Dan, who wants to know, does Soyuz also use RP-1 as fuel? And does he use the same oxidizer that Falcon 9 used to launch Crew-1? Uh, it's extremely similar. Um, it is essentially RP-1, which is just a refined form of kerosene that's very commonly used uh, in a lot of rocket engines. There are some slight differences uh, between the refining process, uh, between the fuel used in the Russian spacecraft uh, and in the Falcon 9 in America, uh, but for most purposes they're essentially the same. And they both use the same oxidizer, liquid oxygen. Uh, the RP-1 and um, the liquid oxygen is used for all three stages uh, of the Soyuz launch vehicle. Um, the Soyuz spacecraft itself uses what's called hypergol fuels, or fuels that don't need an ignition source uh, for all of its maneuvers once it reaches on orbit. That'll do it for now for our questions. If you have any more, remember to keep on getting over to Twitter. Use that hashtag, AskNASA. We'll get through a few more in the launch show, and then we'll get through a whole bunch once we're on orbit for a rendezvous and docking. But for now, continuing with our live coverage of launch, Mark Vandehei, Oleg Novitsky, and Pyotr Dubrov to the International Space Station getting great views of the Soyuz on the launch pad and it's clear sky, so should have a great view for launch today. As of right now, we are just 11 minutes and 11 seconds away from liftoff. Again, that's timed for 2.42 a.m. Central Time, 2.42 and 41 seconds to be exact, 12.42 and 41 seconds over there in Baikonur. The spacecraft was mated to its booster, and the three stages were joined together earlier this week on Monday. And then just 24 hours later on Tuesday, the rocket began its trek to the launch pad, taking off right at about 7 a.m. Baikonur time, then arriving less than two hours later, where it was raised to its vertical position for the final pre-launch preparations. As of right now, it's poised for launch with the three crew members aboard. The Soyuz spacecraft sits high above those three different stages that we walked through a little bit earlier, which uses that kerosene or RP-1 uh, and liquid oxygen as the propellant. For now, though, why don't we take a little bit deeper dive into the Soyuz booster itself. The Soyuz rocket stands 162 feet tall, weighs about 640,000 pounds, and consists of the Soyuz spacecraft inside a protective shroud at the top and the three-stage Soyuz 2.1A booster below. The first stage has four liquid engines strapped to the side of the core vehicle. Each will burn for one minute and 58 seconds before they drop away. The core engine of the first stage also serves as the second stage and continues to burn until four minutes and 57 seconds into the flight. The third stage has a single engine that will ignite before the separation of the second stage, helping to push it away safely. It will burn until the 8 minutes and 46 seconds mark of the flight, and at that point the Soyuz spacecraft will separate from the third stage, having arrived at its preliminary orbit. And continuing to get a look at that Soyuz rocket on the pad, again launching from Site 31 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. We're under 10 minutes away. We're just nine minutes, four seconds, three seconds, two seconds, no seconds away from launch. Continuing to march uh, towards that two, uh, 2:42 and 41 second a.m. Central Time, uh, 7:42 and. 41 seconds GMT, so we're continuing to count down, getting very close now. And as mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, representatives from NASA and Roscosmos are going to be watching the launch unfold as they have with all of the events so far today, just a so short distance away from the launch pad over there in Baikonur. For a quick update, on the activities and how everything's been going, let's go now to NASA Public Affairs Officer, the one and only, Mr. Rob Navius. Rob. As the countdown here in the Central Asian desert reaches its final minutes, we are compelled to take a look back at the historic symmetry of this flight to the International Space Station with events that transpired here 60 years ago today. On April 9th, 1961, Yuri Gagarin was formally and secretly selected to become the first human to fly in space over his backup, cosmonaut German Titov. The final decision was made collectively 
by the iconic Sergei Koryov, the great designer and the head of cosmonaut training at that time, Nikolai Kamanin. And 60 years ago today, the final meeting of the Vostok K rocket and the Vostok 1 spacecraft took place not far from where we are at this hour, setting the stage for its rollout to the launch pad two days later. Today, here at Site 31, a more powerful Soyuz 2.1A booster stands fully fueled to send Bandahai, Novitsky, and Dubrov to a city in the sky, the orbital laboratory that is the International Space Station. With everything proceeding smoothly toward launch and history in the air, that's it from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Now back to you at Mission Control in Houston. Everything is according to the schedule. Control is on board, and I will provide the running commentary of the launch. Kazbek 1, copy. Everything is good on board, and we are ready for launch. Copy, Kazbek. We are just six and a half minutes away from launch, continuing to hear comms uh, between the Soyuz commander, Oleg Novitsky, and the blockhouse engineers down there at Baikonur. As you can see, the crew has closed their visors. That's Novitsky on the bottom of your screen. He's in the center seat, the Soyuz commander. At the top is Pyotr Dubrov. He's in the left seat. You can essentially think of the left seat as kind of the co-pilot. We just got confirmation the launch key has been inserted. And one of potentially the coolest things in all of space flight, there is an actual physical key that is inserted and used to initiate the final launch countdown. At this point, the first and second stage engines are primed and ready for launch. Telemetry has been confirmed and received from the rocket. Again, that's going to be sending telemetry to ground sites all throughout the ride uphill which is expected to take just under nine minutes. We're looking for third stage separation, about eight minutes and 49 seconds into flight. Combustion chamber nitrogen purge. Azbek, uh, camera number one is on. We can see a flight engineer and commander. You just heard combustion chamber nitrogen purge, so they use nitrogen and inert gas uh, to flow through the combustion chamber and purge any vapors or other remnants before they start the full flow of fuel and oxidizer to the engines. Again, using a refined version of kerosene and liquid oxygen to power all of the stages, all three, first, second, and third stages of the Soyuz rocket. And just as a quick reminder, as we get up to the four minute mark, when we launch, the space station will be flying just over northern Uzbekistan, about 335 miles behind the Soyuz spacecraft as it leaves the launch pad. And then by the time it makes the 8 minute, 49 second ride into orbit, the station will have leapfrogged ahead of it, setting it up for that fast track to orbit, about 3 hour and 25 minute rendezvous with the space station. Under three minutes and 20 seconds away, we're awaiting the call that the booster's fuel tanks are being pressurized for flight. This will just help optimize uh, the flow of all of the fuel to the rocket engines, helps add a little bit of structural support as well to the rocket. Oxidizing fuel drain and safety valves are closed. Ground sealing of oxidizer nitrogen to the vehicle is terminated. And at this point, terminating some of the propellant feeds to the rocket. Two things to keep an eye on as we continue to count down. 
There are two umbilical towers, uh, really those two ground structures attached to the rocket itself. Uh, that taller one's going to separate at about 35 seconds before launch, and the smaller one about midway up the rocket will separate, and once you see that separate, we're 15 seconds away from launch. Booster propellant tank pressurization initiated. So there's that call out. The booster tanks are now being pressurized for flight. Again, just helping the, to optimize and facilitate the flow of fuel to those engines in the first and second stage, which will fire simultaneously to begin the initial flight into orbit under two minutes from launch. Fifty-five seconds away from launch, we saw Oleg Novitsky there in the center seat. His flight displays are configured. Vehicle to internal power. Ground propellant seat terminated. And right at 35 seconds, the first umbilical tower separating the vehicle on internal power. We'll have auto sequence start. So the ground propellant feed to the rocket has now completely terminated. Auto sequence initiated. Second umbilical separated, 15 seconds from launch. Launch command for ignition. Second umbilical tower separate. And we see booster ignition. Engines at maximum thrust. And liftoff. Soyuz MS-18 on its way to the International Space Station. Ten seconds, the booster parameters are nominal. Everything is good on board. Hearing nominal performance, the first stage delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust from those four first stage boosters and the single core engine. 30 seconds into the flight, the uh, parameters of the booster are nominal. Everything is fine on board. 40 seconds, uh, the vehicle is stable. Everything is good on board. Continuing to hear good performance calls, a quick look inside the capsule. You can see uh, the crew strapped in and monitoring displays as they continue on their way uphill. Just past the one minute mark into flight. Your and roll are nominal. Seventy seconds into the flight, everything is nominal. Uh, we are good on board. At this point, the space station has already flown over the Baikonur Cosmodrome and now making its way in front of the Soyuz spacecraft. The crew is feeling well. Roughly 90 seconds into flight, the Soyuz rocket already moving more than 2,100 miles per hour, already about 10, 10 miles downrange. Into the flight, all parameters of the booster are nominal. The crew is feeling well at 10 foot is 4, unintelligible. Okay, you received the, the message about the casual parameters, copy. And right on time, we see first stage separation, the Koryov cross, those four strap-on boosters separating. 
Now the single core stage continuing to power the Soyuz spacecraft into flight. Copy. Just before that, the launch escape tower was also jettisoned. Soyuz does maintain escape capability all the way to flight, though, with the stage able to use uh, for a short time uh, small boosters on the shroud itself. And then once the shroud detaches, it will use boosters on the spacecraft. Uh, so the shroud jettison is confirmed. We have controlled descent. And so we heard confirmation the launch shroud has jettisoned in this animation. You can see the Soyuz spacecraft now exposed, continuing under the power of the second stage. 180 seconds into the flight, uh, vehicle stabilization is performing nominally and the crew is feeling well, copy. Second stage is going to continue to fire until four minutes and 37 seconds into flight, so about another minute and 20 seconds. Second, the second stage uh, thrusters are functioning nominally. Everything is good on board. Getting some views from the spacecraft itself as it continues downrange. 230 seconds, vehicle stabilization is performing nominally. Everything is good on board. At this point, the vehicle's already accelerated to just about 6,400 miles per hour, about 172 miles downrange from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Two hundred and fifty seconds into the flight, teach your enroll uh, nominal. Everything is good on board. The pitch yaw and roll calls relating to the the attitude or which way the vehicle is pointing. Hearing nominal is what we want to continue to hear on the way uphill. Everything continuing to perform normally with the Soyuz spacecraft and the rocket. Four minutes and forty seconds into flight. Second stage separation is confirmed. We had better two. And so we heard good confirmation. Second stage is shut down and separated. You saw a piece fly off there. That was the lower skirt of the third stage that was jettisoned right on time as it was supposed to. is performing nominally and everything is good on board. So he's now being propelled by the single engine of the third stage, providing about 67,000 pounds of thrust. This is going to continue to burn for about four minutes. It's going to shut down at eight minutes and 46 seconds into flight. Into the flight, uh, the third stage is functioning nominally. Everything is good on the board. Copy, Kazbek. Three hundred and fifty seconds into the flight, uh, everything is nominal. Uh, everything is good on board. Three hundred and eighty seconds into the flight, uh, third stage thrusters are functioning nominally. The crew are feeling well. Copy, Kasbek. Four hundred seconds into the flight, uh, the vehicle is stable. Everything is good on board. Now just about two minutes left, a little under two minutes of power on the third stage. Once it shuts down and separates just a few seconds later, the Soyuz spacecraft will be flying free. And a series of pre-programmed commands will execute, deploying a number of the appendages, uh, the antennas, 
uh, and the solar arrays needed to power the spacecraft on its way to the station. Uh, and a number of antennas will also deploy for communications and tracking, uh, including those that will be responsible for communicating with the station as the Soyuz makes its automated rendezvous and docking. Seven and a half minutes since launch, we have about a minute 20, a minute 30 left until the third stage has done its job and will shut down and separate. Four hundred and seventy seconds. Third stage thrusters are functioning nominally. Now in the final minute of powered flight for the Soyuz 2.1A booster. Coming up soon, we'll see third stage shutdown and separation. 490 seconds into the flight, uh, vehicle stabilization is performing nominally and everything is good on board. We'll look to confirm good orbital insertion, essentially confirming that the spacecraft is in the intended uh, altitude, in the intended orbit. We are ready. And now standing by for third stage separation, shutdown and separation. 520 seconds into the flight. Kazbeki, uh, orbit insertion is confirmed. Uh, our congratulations, and now uh, Moscow, MCC Moscow will talk to you. Kazbeki, Moscow. Kazbeki, Moscow. And so we saw a good shutdown and separation of the third stage. Solar array has deployed, standing by for confirmation that all antennas have deployed. Kazbeki, Moscow, how copy? Kazbeki, MCC, Moscow. It is Kazbeki still. I am ready to uh, provide the data as per page 36. Kazbeki, how was the insertion? Moscow, how, how did you copy? I copy loud and clear. Kazbeki, how do you copy us? We copy you five by five. I am ready to give you data as per page 36. Yes, we are standing by for the first measurement uh, data from you. So we are receiving the image right now. Copy. So 10 seconds. So RDR, yes, RDR uh, will be the dynamic ops um, Command will be sent via Karel, command radio link. Radio link. So everything was on time. Uh, the air there was on time. Yes, it is confirmed. But Vicky was standing by for the first measurement from you. Here the first measurement at the time 10:52:28. 28. The SR pressure 8:01. BO pressure 8:23. In PO pressure 8, 23, uh, in Eight nine one in the instrument compartment, and I'm ready to give you the data for form number three. Go ahead. Seventeen seventeen point seven eighteen seventeen point three nineteen two seven two number twenty zero point eight twenty one one point two twenty two three two five twenty three. 3, 2, 4, 24, 16.9, 25, 17.5, 26, 2, 7, 2. Propellant is 8, 8, 0. Copy, Kazbek 2. Now please check uh, the indicators. 
in work. And so we're continuing to get a lot of comms between the Soyuz spacecraft and the Russian Mission Control Center in Koryov, hearing them uh, call Kozbek. That is the, the call sign for the, the Soyuz spacecraft uh, with uh, Commander Oleg Novitsky. Uh, we did hear a, a good confirmation of uh, all solar arrays, both solar arrays and all of the appendages, so all of the antennas did deploy successfully. So we had a nominal flight on the way uphill. We had a good orbital insertion. The initial orbit for the Soyuz spacecraft today is right at around 200 kilometers by 242 kilometers, or about 124 by 150 miles. Get ready for the recording. So the KDU manifold switchover will be after the first burn maneuver. It's page 42. Uh, you have the time recorded. How copy? Copy. Page 42. Uh, 11, 20, 6, 40 is the time. Yes, correct, of the switchover. And after the tank switchover by Karel, uh, there will be selection of the first manifold depot. So, and uh, what stage of the procedure is that, Moscow? So we will send the command by command radio link. So the first manifold will be selected before the rendezvous. Copy. Then T0, so the first automated rendezvous, and stage 45, the ECOV in headed 12, 10, 0, 0. It is also recorded. Copy, page 45, 12, 10, 0, 0, it's ECOV in headed. Yes, that's correct. Now, compass of the second orbit, 12, 14 is the time. Copy 12, 14 second compass. Yes, that's correct. From input 2, you will have uh, to activate a display TV uh, before the compass. So the command that should be sent is G3. Yes, display uh, relay is G3 command. And the uh, you will have to activate the COM assets from the panel. Yes, that's correct. So that's all I have for now. Copy. And we're sending by uh, to get the results of the five-minute measurement. This is Kazbek 2. I'm ready to report. And we're ready to copy. The sub pressure is... Again. PO. Pressure 822. The pressure is 890. How did you copy? Could you please repeat the sub pressure reading? Давление uh, высота 801. 801. This is the sub pressure. Is that correct? Давление высота 800 ровно. The sub pressure is 800. Copy. 800. Kazbek, this is from Moscow. Kazbek, this is Moscow. For your information, the vehicle was inserted into the orbit of the Soyuz satellite. Inserted into the orbit of the artificial satellite. The structure is deployed. You are going to open the pressure helmet, release shoulder straps, and you can also deactivate the thermal control sensor. Copy pressure helmet to open and um, 
to where it goes to release the straps uh, and uh, activate the thermal control sensors. The vehicle and search is complete. And, and guys, this is uh, uh, all of you. Uh, how do you read me? Um, uh, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on the successful vehicle orbital insertion. All the telemetry parameters are nominal, and other than that, everything is fine. Uh, so uh, your goal to um, uh, proceed with all the work that you have to do. Copy all. It can work. And this is Kazbek 1, thermal control sensor deactivated, and the uh, helmets are now open. Copy. And Kazbek, current compass will be over at 11.03. Copy. 11.03. All right, so we've been hearing a lot of chatter between the Soyuz MS-18 spacecraft and the Russian Mission Control Center in Koryov. Again, the crew safely on orbit. Uh, the Soyuz spacecraft deployed all of its uh, solar rays and antennas following a flawless flight uphill. Um, we do have a little bit of time. We should be getting some launch replays pretty soon. So in the meantime, we'll take some more Ask NASA questions. Uh, this first one's asking how long are these astronauts going to stay on board the International Space Station? Well, most flights typically last about six months. Um, as of right now, uh, these three currently plan to stay about six months, a little more than six months on board the International Space Station, uh, and that's a typical stay. Uh, the spacecraft itself uh, has a uh, on-orbit on, on lifetime of about 200 days. Um, so that's typically a max that a crew will stay on board the International Space Station. Uh, obviously, you have the capability to sometimes swap seats, uh, depending on how the flights downhill or down uh, down the schedule take place. Uh, but for right now, these crew members are scheduled to spend about six months on board the station. Uh, this next question asks, why does the Dragon Journey take more time than the Soyuz? That's a great question. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to uh, the difficulties that come with orbital mechanics. Um, it, you have to launch at very precise times to make journeys like the one we're seeing today. Um, and it's only been possible through years of, of evolution um, and a lot of lessons learned on behalf of uh, the Russian rocket scientists and the flight planners. Um, typically for many years, the Soyuz took about two days uh, to arrive at the International Space Station and uh, if, they're, if they have any issues with any of their burns or their engine firings on the way uh, to the space station today, uh, they would default into what is uh, a 34 orbit rendezvous, which takes about two days to get there. So uh, it really just comes down to really understanding the capabilities of the spacecraft. Uh, and once you get that, you can try to, to narrow down. There are, there are also a lot of other things that come into play when you plot out how long it's going to take you to get there. Um, typically, the shortest that a Dragon spacecraft will be able to make it to the space station is going to be about six to eight hours right now, uh, but again, has to be uh, at a very specific time with the space station at a very specific place. And if it's any longer than that, we'll typically extend that out just to make sure that the crew has time to sleep and we're not trying to keep them up for, you know, 12 to 14 hours straight before they try to dock a spacecraft to the space station. All right, this next one asks, how do you make oxygen on the space station? That's a great question. I mentioned that a little bit earlier, that we're able to recycle a lot of the, the life support systems. Uh, we make oxygen through a process called electrolysis, and that's where you basically take a water molecule and you split it. You use electricity and you separate it into its parts. Water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. And you can either take that excess hydrogen and vent it off board, or uh, you can put it through a different process. We have a technology demonstration on board called Sabatier, which takes uh, the excess hydrogen from when we make oxygen by uh, separating the water molecules, and you combine it uh, with CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, that gets scrubbed out of the air that the astronauts are exhaling. 
And if you take that excess hydrogen and combine it with CO2, you can make more H2O. And so the goal is to eventually get to a point where you have what's called a closed loop life support system, um, where you're able to just kind of constantly cycle through all of your breathing gases, all of your water that you're launching, so you don't have to launch a bunch of reserves. Um, we're still perfecting a lot of those technologies. That's really why the International Space Station is so important, because we can do that just 250 miles above our heads and really make sure that we understand those technologies very well before we start sending crew members to the moon and eventually on to Mars, where when you're going to Mars, you're talking about about a three-year round trip, and you have to make absolute sure that all of those systems are going to work. Um, our next question asks, which docking port on the space station are they going to dock to? They are headed for the Rosviet module. It's also known as Mini Research Module Number 1, and it's on the Earth-facing side of the Zarya, the functional cargo block module in the Russian segment. And that's the only one open on the space station right now. You can see what it's going to look like a little bit later this morning. Uh, the Soyuz MS-18 with the arrow there. It's not there yet, but that's what it's going to look like, and that's the Rosviet port that you can see it attached to. Our next question comes from Shane. I want to know how fast are they traveling roughly right now? So right now they're traveling at about 17,000 miles an hour, a little bit over, um, but they're essentially going orbital velocity. So at the altitude they're at, uh, they'll start out at about 16,700 miles an hour or so, and then they'll continue to increase their speed through a series of what's called delta velocity burns. By increasing their speed, they're able to raise their orbit until they're roughly on the exact same orbital height and trajectory as the International Space Station, which itself is about 260 miles over the Earth right now. And by that point, they'll be traveling closer to about 17,500 miles an hour. Our next question is, who will then be the next ISS commander? Who's the next space station commander? That's a great question. Um, so right now on board the, the space station, uh, it's Sergei, or Sergei Rizhikov. Uh, he's actually going to hand off command uh, to Shannon Walker, one of the Crew-1 astronauts, uh, just about a week from now, uh, just before he comes home, along with Sergei Kuchverkov and uh, Kate Rubens. Um, and so he's going to be handing off to Shanna Walker. She's on the right side of this picture in the front row. And she'll be the commander for a couple of days until the Crew-2 mission launches to the space station, at which point she will be handing off to uh, Aki Hoshide from the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. And then he'll be the commander uh, for several months during Expedition 65. And then towards the end of that flight, uh, he'll hand off to... Uh, Thomas Pesquet of the European Space Agency who will be the commander uh, for a couple of weeks at the very end of their mission. All right, our next question asked, why do Russian rockets launch from Kazakhstan? Uh, that's a great question, and it goes back to the very beginning of the Russian space program. Uh, the very early days uh, when the space program was starting up, I'm going to cut that off, and we are going to some launch replays now. And that was our first replay, that launch taking place right on time at 7.42 and 41 seconds GMT, 12.42 and 41 seconds in Baikonur. We should have four replays coming to you this morning.
and that was replay two again we're expecting four of these launch replays for you this morning it was a, a very smooth eight minute and 49 second ride uphill all three stages performing as expected delivering so used to its initial orbit And three down, one more to go for launch replay. Again, launch took place right on time at 7.42 and 41 seconds GMT, 12.42 and 41 seconds out there in Baikonur. A flawless ride to orbit the crew continuing to orbit the Earth this time. And here's our fourth and final replay. All right, and so that was our final launch replay. So we are going to bring a close to our launch coverage. At this time, the crew continuing their ride uphill. They're about seven minutes away from their first major burn to start catching up with the International Space Station. And as long as everything goes well with uh, this and the uh, following burns, we're looking at a docking uh, just about two hours and 52 minutes from now. And so, run through our continuing coverage for you real quick and so we'll go off the air for a little bit we'll be back for docking coverage all of these times central u.s time at 5 15 a.m and we expect docking at about 6 7 a.m central time or 11 7 a.m or 11 7 gmt following that we'll have a video file with all of the best launch feeds uh, giving you some replays while we wait for the hatch opening. We'll come back live in the air at 7.30 a.m. Central. We're tracking to a hatch opening right around 8 a.m. Central Time. And then we'll wrap up the day with one final video file giving you the highlights from everything docking, hatch opening, everything that unfolded today, delivering three new crew members to the space station. So 
That'll do it for right now. Keep sending in those questions using the hashtag AskNASA. We'll get through a whole bunch more uh, once we get to our rendezvous and docking show. But I do want to thank you for tuning in, staying up late or waking up early to uh, catch three crew members flying to the International Space Station. We'll be back in just a little while to show you docking live as we get ready to increase the population on station from 7 all the way up to 10. So a lot more exciting stuff still to come. So one more time, thank you for tuning in. We'll be back in just a couple hours. And this is Mission Control Houston.